FIFA Women's World Cup, this tournament means something. This is the time for women's football to shine and on these shores, an entire fan base is looking at the England Lionesses. It's a team capable of something huge and a team we all know are capable of winning along with a number of other sides at the tournament in France. In the first of our Sportspiel FIFA World Cup special episodes, we are lucky enough to dive into that squad as we're joined by one of those lionesses in the form of Wolfsburg goalkeeper Mary Earps. In our chat, the 26-year-old international gives us an insight into the squad and the work manager Phil Neville has put in into creating a positive environment. We get to hear about the training, the camaraderie and the willingness to succeed among this group of players. But that's not all. As well as all things World Cup, there's time to look at how Mary's game has changed since her move to Germany and there's also the small matter of a discussion about goal sizes in the women's game to be had. Welcome to the first of the Sportspiel FIFA World Cup specials. Mary, thank you so much for coming on to the show uh, ahead of the World Cup and it's a very warm welcome to the podcast. How is everything at the moment in the camp? Yeah, good. Obviously, we're kind of in the final stages of preparation now. It's It feels like, yeah, it feels like we've been preparing forever. Um, obviously, it's been in the back of our minds for such a long time um, and we've been in kind of a pre, pre-training camp for the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, every, everything's going well. We've got our final friendly on Saturday versus New Zealand. So that'll be another great test for us. And then uh, we fly out to France shortly after that. Exactly. And yeah, for, for the listeners, we're recording this after the warm-up game against Denmark. That was last weekend. Uh, before the final warm-up game against New Zealand. So from your perspective in the squad, um, how, how do you feel the mood is at the moment, considering there's not that long to go until the tournament actually starts? I think, it, I think it's really positive. I th- I, of course, I'm always going to say that. I think there's definitely an element of, of impatience. People are so keen to just kind of get out there. Like, that's definitely my feeling, personally. Um, you know, you've been, this is my first World Cup and I know a few of the girls have have been there and done that before, but I don't think the feeling really changes from what I can understand from other people's stories. But, you know, I've I've been thinking about this and working towards this and dreaming about this ever since I was a kid, you know, and I'm I'm 26 now and like, obviously it's amazing to, to, to be here and and whatever and to have got to this to be selected but I'm just so keen to just get on the plane get out there and get in our first group game and just get started really exactly and and looking at the squad dynamics from the outside in it looks like one of the most united squads we've seen um for an England team and I know a few other people have said that be it reporters or on social media as well is is that a fair analysis of of you as a group yeah I think togetherness is one of our key values I think we've been We've been building towards it for a number of years. I know even if you speak to the girls um, who went to the Euros, like that was my first tournament and it was it was incredible. There was a lot of togetherness there as well. And obviously then you go through a bit of a transitional phase and new players come into the squad. Some people leave the squad. And so there's an element of rebuilding. So it's been really important to try and stay as tight knit as possible. Um, and even today, the girls were talking about how important it is that we don't let out the outside get in and when you're on such you know you're on you're on a world stage you know everybody's watching you it's really easy to to let outside influences affect you and and get in your bubble even you know and it doesn't have to be something major it can be a social media comment or a family comment or comments from a friend or pressure from people oh why aren't you playing or simple as that it can start to creep in and create that negativity so we've worked really hard as a group to uh, make sure we have that togetherness so yeah I think we're in a really good place going into the tournament I'm really excited yeah exactly and and ahead of the tournament I know a lot of you have already said that Obviously, winning it is the ultimate goal. But yep. considering the, the hype around the tournament and it being your first tournament as well, how easy is it to actually keep all those nerves or excitement in check and measured and that your primary focus is on preparing as best you can, I suppose? 
you know what it's been it, it's it's been it, the excitement i think is the hardest thing i've not really felt nerves yet um I, I, I'm sure people, there's some members of the group who who have who do get nerves early. I, I'm one of those who it kind of comes in like on the game day or you know creeping in towards the match. Before that, I'm reasonably relaxed and I'm just kind of going from training session to training session. And I think the most important thing that we've got to focus on is going from game to game and that attitude of um, really taking everything as it comes because obviously we've been very clear in our ambitions. Um, we want to win the tournament, but you can't do that unless you win your first group game. You can't do that if you win the next game and the next game and the next game. So it's really easy to get lost in, oh, look at that beautiful shiny trophy, look at that shiny thing and and lose sight of actually the thing in front of you. And again, I think like sharing experiences is super important because, you know, like I've been to the Euros, it was amazing, but Tony's told me everything me and Tony have been sharing a room now for nearly four years and the amount of conversations we've had about yeah, Mary, the Euros is amazing, but the World Cup is another level. The World Cup is the creme de la creme. Like you can't get bigger than that, and you know that's that's. I think that's true for for everyone in in this country, especially. You know, they see the World Cup as the absolute pinnacle. So um, yeah, just not getting lost in that ambition and making sure we take every single game and realize we could go home at any moment, and using that as our motivation to stay for as long as we possibly can. And, win the damn thing yeah exactly and that that lost in the moment thing it seems to there seems to be a few teams that can relate to that if you like because i bear in mind the the hockey team that won gold at the olympics um and they sort of kept themselves off from social media because they didn't want to get lost in that side of thing is that something that you're doing as a group or is it just about getting the right amount of social media input because it can have a positive effect as well oh for sure so social media is it's, it's unbelievable. Like it can be so positive and so negative in so many different ways. I think we've all, we could all recall stories where we've had really positive experiences and we could also recall a lot of experiences where we've had negative, it's been a negative influence on us, you know, for a day, for a week, for a month or whatever. It can really, it can really affect you if you let it. Um, but I think it, it's, it's individual. You know, some people are really like, no, I need to be off social media. I can't have it. It's a distraction. And some people are like, no, that's totally fine. Like, it doesn't bother me. If I don't want to use it, I won't go on it. Or I can manage myself. And again, uh, some people really like to be on it. Like, they really, they love it. It's a way of them interacting with their family, their friends, and sharing moments. And I think, you know, when you're in sport, like, you do want to share the happy moments because we have a, a hell of a lot of unhappy ones. You think about, yeah, you think about how many games you lose or how many training practices you have, which things haven't gone right. So when you do win a game or you do win a trophy or whatever, you want to share that because you've earned the right to. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, I think it's super individual. Um, I don't think we'll be taking a like a unanimous vote on it. We'll just be going with, OK, what does this person want? OK, I need to respect that. OK, what does this person want? And yeah, just being understanding of everyone's individual needs. Are you someone who particularly likes to to go on and interact as best you can? I I go up and down with it. Like I I like social media. I I particularly like Instagram. I like to be able to share photos because I feel like it's a really nice thing to look back on as sort of like a timeline and all the things that you've you've kind of achieved and gone through. Um, but I do. I am a big believer in like it's not real life. Social media isn't real life. You know, you don't see the times where I'm racking my brain out because I can't nail this one specific thing in training. You just see me, you know, I did the double this year and we won the She Believe. So you just see the fact that I've won three trophies in six months and you think my life's brilliant. And it's been an unbelievable six months. I don't deny that. However, there's hard times along the way. And, and I try and keep it as real as possible, like in the sense of I don't want to post every five seconds because people get this idea that your life's perfect and that's not the influence that I want to have on people. I want to be a role model. I want to be, I want to be seen as someone who's, you know, strong when things are hard, not just happy when things are good. Um, and I think, you know, especially with the younger generation, like I've got a younger brother and sister and, you know, not, I, I, I'm just aware of like the influence I can have on people like them if they constantly think that, oh, I've got a brand new pair of trainers from Nike, you know, like I, I love what I do, but you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's more complicated than just the, 
things you see on social media. Exactly. There's, there's a whole lot of hard grafting behind right. the scenes, exactly. essentially. Um, and in terms of the, the She Believes Cup victory, because you just alluded to it there, how important has that been in, in breeding confidence with, with each member of the squad? Yeah, I think to win a tournament like that, I mean, people will say it's a friendly tournament, but if you've played in it, you know it ain't a that friendly. It's a tournament. Uh, and, you know, it's it's the top, you know, the top four teams in the world going at it. And, you know, you've got the whole, you've got the elements of travel, time difference. Like, it's a really challenging tournament in so many different ways. Um, not just from a football point of view. Um, you know, you're in the middle of your season, you're coming up to crunch time. That, Like, you know, I think I think the She Believes, when we came back, that was when we had our Champions League quarterfinal, I think. I think it was shortly after that, you know, a few weeks after that. So, um, you're balancing so many things. Um, it's a really tough tournament, and it's really important to get yourself in a, in a winning habit. And I think that is, yeah, to to give to have that and um, to have that experience as a group will hopefully uh, really help us in in the World Cup. You know, there was times where we were leading, we were behind. Uh, good goals, bad goals, good attack, bad defending, whatever. And when you can come through all of that and still get the trophy at the end. It's just kind of like, okay, cool, nothing can phase us. Let's go. It gives you a lot of things to relate to, seeing that Absolutely. you've been in that position before. Absolutely. And it, we'll touch on the manager now, Phil Neville, of course. Um, and he's been the boss for almost a year and a half now. Uh, and obviously we all know what happened before that, but what kind of environment has he and his staff brought to you um, or brought to the team? Um, I think... The, in terms of obviously his style of play is a little bit different. He likes to play, you know, tight uh, possession football. Um, in terms of the environment in the camp, um, yeah, I think you know it's friendly. He likes to stay in communication with people. He likes to have a little bit of banter and take the mick out of people quite a lot, which I think suits quite a lot of us. Because um, yeah, a lot of us are always joking around, not taking life too seriously. So um, yeah, it's just I think because he's been in men's football as well, and I think from what I've heard of. Like obviously having friends and uh, coaches and uh, previous coaches in men's football, they tell you that the banter is another level, um, borderline unacceptable. Really, the stories I hear, not even borderline, over the line. Um, so yeah, I think he's just kind of used to that dynamic, um, but he also expects really high standards. So it's definitely getting that balance between yeah, we're here to have a good time, but we're also here to work hard. And yeah, I think that's the the environment he's tried to create. Yeah, is there any anything specific that you or maybe other members of the team have either learned or gotten better at or stronger at since he's come in? Oh, okay. Uh, I've never been asked this question before. Um, I, try and I do. think, uh, yeah, I think there's so many things that you're constantly working on. Um, it's hard to pinpoint just a few um, because I, you know, people always ask me, "What do you want to get better at?" And I could reel off a list of about a thousand things. Um, so I think you're constantly looking for that little bit of improvement. I think where Phil comes in is, you know, he likes to be, um, he likes he likes to communicate with you. Like, so when I was away in Germany, he wanted to stay in communication. And I think that was really important because it's easy when you're like, you know, you're not playing in the WSL, so your games aren't on TV, whatever. You, I, you know, I have to get the footage to him and, um, share things with him and you know and obviously I have that relationship with Mark Mason the goalkeeper coach as well so we're always talking about things that I want to improve and work on so yeah I think there's there's so many things I think that one of the, the thing that he, that kind of sticks out in my mind that he's kind of brought in that maybe everybody's kind of got better at as a result of is rondos he he loves a rondo you'll often hear him shouting on the sideline rondos 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 and the goalkeepers are involved in that so I think yeah, I think as a result of that, we've probably all got, um, yeah, got that a little bit better on the ball. And um, yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, because it's the way he involves you goalkeepers as, or treats you as outfield players, I suppose. Right. Which is, which yeah. is a big change, maybe. Yeah, and it suits me. Like, that's that's how I like to play. I like to have the ball at my feet. I've grown up with the ball at my feet and I always want to play out. I don't just want to boom it long. Um, and it's great to be able to be in a team where that's a core part of, of the pattern of play. Exactly. Um, if you can put your finger on it, and I know we've talked a lot about the togetherness of the team, but what do you think is the main strength that this squad has uh, in its favour? 
I actually think the versatility of the group is huge. I think we've got so many different types of player. Um, we've got so many different types of people, characters. So I feel like we've got a little bit of everything. You know, we've got the strong, rugged, like dirty, get the job type of player. We've got the tight and technical players, you know, who want to like pass, pass it around and pop it. We've got the we've got the fast players who can who can run in behind. We've got the tricky players who can make something happen and do a little bit of magic. You know, I really, you know, we've got obviously we've got great goalkeepers who can save the ball and and produce magic saves. And and I think that's that's really important. I think at this level, hard work and skill is kind of like a non-negotiable. Like there's obviously a certain level of skill you need to have to be an international player. But I think we've got we've got strength and depth and and versatility. So I feel like, yeah, you know, we've got people who can take unbelievable set pieces um, and and pass the ball and put it on a sixpence. So uh yeah i think yeah the versatility i would say that which really helps considering who you might come up against when it comes yeah, to tournament time in, in, a, in tournament football you, you know you don't know who you're going to get some of the time you know it, it's dependent on results and you need to be able to people get injured you know they have bad games people have good games like the squad is going to change and the team's going to change so you need to be able to step up in any mo- like someone could get ill and people have to step up or you know you're playing a certain type of opposition and you want the formation changes so yeah it's super important to be able to adapt to that yeah exactly Um, and moving on to more more about yourself and also reflecting on the year you've had moving from the WSL and Reading over to Wolfsburg in Germany um, and a a season that resulted in a double as well so silverware there but how much do you think your game has developed moving over to to, to Germany considering where it was maybe this, this time last year it's been it's been an unbelievable season for for so many reasons. I it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, I think I've developed a lot as a player and as a lot as a lot as a person. I think you know I've matured and become more independent as a result. And I'm hoping that that will you know come into fruition, you know, and be really evident over the next few years and for the rest of my career because um, the proof is in the pudding, as I like to say. But um, uh, yeah, I, I feel I've developed a lot in, the, in these last 12 months. Um, I've got to train with and play against some of the best players in the world. Um, you know, training with these types of players every single day, World Cup winners, Olympic uh, gold medalists, um, European champions. Like, these are the type of people, you know, you're looking around at the training ground going, yeah, this, this is exactly where I want to be. Um you know, so and obviously working with with Amu, who's the German number one and um, considered one of the best goalkeepers in the world. It's just, yeah, it's been an, a very educational year. Um, so yeah, I'm really hoping that 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 other people can see that when when they see me play um, over the coming seasons and 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 yeah, hopefully that will be the the telling tale. But yeah, me personally, I I feel like I've come on a hell of a lot. Yeah. What have been the, the biggest challenges of that move? Because I know you've mentioned the language side of things before in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the language, of course, like all the meetings and uh, emails and uh, any yeah, any training document is all in German. And that's a lot to get your head around. Um, but by the end of it, it, I didn't really feel it was an issue. Obviously, the first I had no before I went there I had no German skills at all I had no idea about the language I didn't know anything um but yeah definitely after you've kind of settled in and got used to the language even if I couldn't speak it I could understand it a little bit more so um yeah that kind of got easier I think um I think to be honest I feel like I was kind of lucky like I when I went there I settled in so quickly I found a group of a group of girls who I just seemed to get on with like a house on fire and that helped massively um, because, I, you know, you can just be like, okay, what time's training? Okay, did I miss anything? Or, you know, because sometimes training does change and you, you don't get the memo or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think that definitely helped. Uh, you know, culturally, I don't think it was it, it was too difficult to fit in, you know, but st- still be in Europe, but, you know, just little things like the shops don't open on Sunday or, the post office closes earlier, just little things like that. But um, yeah, I think I was really lucky with with the friendship group that I fell into. 
Any, whatever, can you put your finger on maybe the biggest differences as well compared to playing in England versus playing in Germany? Um, I think, obviously, Wolfsburg is a completely different kettle of fish. Like, it's the best German team. So, obviously, the level of player there in that team, you've got so many internationals. It's so, um, it's so rare to have that, I think. Um, I think they're a very, very special team. Um, but I think in terms of the Bundesliga versus the Women's Super League, um, I feel like maybe it's just been established for a little bit longer. So um, the style of play is a little bit more concrete. So you've got like uh, every team, regardless of whether they're bottom or top, will try and play out from the back, will try and keep possession. That's really kind of their philosophy and it's it's clear. And, you know, I was really taken aback by that at first. I was thought, well, there's not one team that's tried to punt it long or anything like that. Um which I think you do get in the in the English game a little bit, um, but again, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it, it's competitive in different ways. Um, you know, like it, you know, the I remember so many competitive games with teams which are, and I'll say in inverted commas for the podcast, <laughs> like yeah, our, our bottom end of the table, and you're only winning one nil or two one. You know, they're tough games, and I think. English, I think tactically, I think the English league is. I think I think English football is always like that. People will set up to, they don't always set up to win, but they'll set up to not lose, which creates a really competitive game. And sometimes that means they end up nicking the game on a counter or something like that. Where Germans, it's very like, no, this is our style, this is how we play, and this will always be how we play, no matter whether it's sunny, whether it's raining, whether we're playing against Wolfsburg, whether we're playing against Bremen, it will always be the case. So. And considering maybe that the way the WSL has changed with it becoming fully professional as well, and, and maybe you see the teams at the higher end of the table looking to play that way, I think the way Manchester City play, for example, is more like that rather than punting it. Um, and as someone who used to do shifts in the cinema um, alongside your early uh, footballing career, do you see that maybe the, the professionalism of the WSL and various other developments in the the women's game here is that the start of women's football getting the recognition it has probably been crying out for and really has deserved yeah i think you know what i think everybody i would like to say in the world I, and i don't think that's a stretch to say that but definitely in europe everybody's looking at the women's game in england because more men's teams are starting to get behind it and influence budgets in a positive way. Um, more brands and big companies are getting involved and in saying, listen, there's a big market and women's football is huge. It's, it's going to be huge and we just need to keep getting more of that. Obviously, of course, you hear that, you know, the, the not so positive stories, you know, with your Yeovils and your Sunderlands and your Notts Counties. And we have to be careful that that doesn't occur more and more but I think there's huge potential and I know and I know for a fact like the amount of times I would be asked what's the differences between German and uh, English football don't like why did you come over to Germany English football is growing all the time like um do you think the future of women's football is in England like they they consider it so highly because of the things that are happening kind of behind closed doors and the more that that happens and it's not necessarily about money money does come with it it's you know it's about tv deals it's about more coverage it's about brands getting on board and just just a whole level of you know and that then affects how perfect like the more girls can become professional it's just a cycle the more that more professionals we have the more professional the game is the better the players become they can train more they can commit more of their lives to it um they can get better as players it becomes more entertaining to watch tv deals want to get involved the professionalism and it's just this cycle that that can really take off and, and i think it is starting to i think i think about like you know i've been playing senior football now since i was 16 I've playing the wsl since i was 17 like like the the professionalism of the game has gone like you know when i was at doncaster i just turned 17 and i was still as you say doing shifts in the cinema like and now i've just done a season in germany like it, playing fully professionally like not having to worry about anything so yeah it was it's it's crazy and hopefully it just keeps continuing to grow yeah it is it is remarkable to see and <laughs> as a West Ham fan myself watching them in the third tier and now that they're in yeah. the top tier you can see how quickly it can change in just a matter of a year or Look, two 
essentially. Loyal fan rewarded, and now they're in the WSL one. Exactly, yeah. And the FA I'm Cup final too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is there anything else you think should be tapped into, or maybe um, whether sponsors can get involved, anything like that, to keep that momentum going, and maybe just make sure it's not this one-off high point and that the interest doesn't drop away? I don't know. You probably have to ask someone in commercial who knows a lot more <laughs> about it. But, I mean, I think it's I think it's really important for businesses to, of course, get involved with clubs and continue to do that, but also to get behind individuals. You know, more sponsorship deals for athletes, I think, would be fantastic. And that also helps you know create more role models you know for like there's so many young girls now and boys that look up to I don't want to say me but you know there's some people in this in in this this squad you know who who have done who have really influenced so many people and I'd like to think as a squad we're also doing that you know and for brands and sponsors to kind of get behind the individuals and you're not only showing their personality you're also creating role models for young kids and that is so, so, so important that kids have something, somebody and, and, and a sport that motivates them, inspires them. And um, I know with, like, I'm not saying without football, I'd be in a bad place, nothing like that. But football centred me as, as a kid. It always gave me something to focus on and to strive for. And it taught me a lot about work ethic and uh, and, and communication and, and team and teamwork and team skills. It gave me so much. And it would be a shame for, you know, 50%, 52% of the population, however much it are, are women, to be kind of, to not have as much access as, as what they deserve, you know? Um, and I think, yeah, so that's what I'd say. Yeah, exactly. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to get basically your thoughts on a couple of topics that have been talking points recently. The first being the goal sizes discussion, um, which has become a recent talking point when, Chelsea boss Emma Hayes obviously uh, t- mentioned about or suggested smaller goals could be brought in for the women's game. And obviously being a goalkeeper yourself, yeah. wondered if that is something we should consider or should we be focusing on the coaching side of things uh, as an alternative? <laughs> I've had, we've had debates about this, actually, because mm-hmm. I think it came out while we were away. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I personally don't, don't agree that goals should be smaller. Um, I and I not that I take it personally but obviously my job is to stop goals going in and I think I'm more than capable of covering the goal of course I'm not as tall as a man I don't have as much muscle as a man's likelihood is I can't jump as high as a man whatever you can always make those comparisons I think we should get out of that habit of comparing the men's and women's game football is football but you shouldn't I think the men's and women's games are two completely different entities and they should be treated as such and you know you're never going to get the same pace never I don't I don't think even if women are working on it for 10 to like 10 20 30 years you're going to get the same pace because we don't have the same genetic makeup um I'm no biology expert but that's just my personal opinion and I think that our role is to make it as entertaining as possible through our technique and through our yeah our finesse and and we're athletes in different ways, and that's totally fine. We're we're different types of athletes. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover the sa- the goal the same as a I don't know as a six foot four um, goalkeeper. I don't know if Joe Hart's six foot four or six foot one, whatever it is. Like that is the brutal reality of the situation. But I hope that if you watch me play, you can see I I'm, I do okay. Like of course, there's always things that I'm looking to improve on, but I don't. I would never. I'd never want to be like, oh, yeah, can we just make the goals smaller? Like, I just don't think that's the answer, you know? And the girls were talking about, okay, well, you can make the ball smaller or you can make the pitch smaller or, you know, you're never going to have that. You're always going to be making those comparisons. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a debate that I'm sure we'll, we'll keep on going, but I think sure. that's generally a, a healthy debate to have in the first place. To bring the conversation full circle and back to the World Cup, since that's why we're here after all, um, yeah. with the World Cup getting the coverage that it is, is this maybe one of the best opportunities that you can remember to really change the face of women's football? And how much of a responsibility is that on your shoulders and other players' shoulders? Without question, this is the biggest opportunity 
uh, that women's football has ever seen. I think it's, yeah, you can just sense it. It's hard to put it into words, but you can just sense there's more interest than ever. There's more media cover- coverage than ever. Um, you know, more brands are involved, um, offering to, I don't know, do the different things, wanting to campaign in different ways. You can sense that there's something special going on. And I am very, very excited. You know, it's, it's going to be, obviously it's in France and the French are notoriously good at bringing big crowds, hostile crowds. Um, so I think there'll be great atmospheres in the stadium, um, particularly if you're French, but it will be, you know, it'll be nice and tasty for us as well. And I think that's, those, these are unbelievable experiences. Um, and yeah, I think, I believe that the pressure is a privilege. So I don't, I, and I, I don't necessarily think that, that, that there's a pressure. There's definitely an expectation. And I think expectation is a compliment, you know, because if people are expecting you to do things, then they think you're good at something. They think you're capable. And so, yeah, I think we're in a great position. I think for sure this is going to change the women's game and we just have to make it as much of a positive change as possible. So the better we are, the better show we put on, the more entertaining we are um, on the pitch the more people are going to turn around across the globe and go, wow, this is something that we really want to watch. More businesses are going to turn around and go, hey, this is something we need to be a part of because we're going to miss a trick here. We're going to miss a huge gap in the market. So let's get behind it. Let's get involved with it. And I think that's truly powerful. Absolutely. And final question, what are you most looking forward to once the tournament gets underway? Very big question. I can't. That is so tough because... Right now, all I can think about is the first group game. I'm I'm so excited for that. For I, I'm excited for so much of it. I'm so excited to 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 not to fly because I hate flying, but to like land at the airport and kind of feel the buzz in the airport. Um, I'm excited to watch the first game. I'm excited to watch the games every night with the girls before we play our game, all as a group. You know, I, I'm I'm excited to to train there, to play in the stadiums, to, to be with this squad and just hopefully achieve something really special. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm excited for so much and to just kind of try and enjoy every single moment. But the, the first thing's first and that's the, the our first group match. So I'm all eyes on that. Exactly. It's, it's take it one game at a time, but I'm sure you and everyone else watching will hugely enjoy the tournament as well when it gets started. Um, I know all of us are buzzing for it uh, and I know there's going to be plenty of fans uh, who will be looking forward to the start of it as well. So I'll round this off by saying thank you so much, Mary, for coming on again uh, and giving us a bit of your time because I know camp is very hectic at the moment. And we wish you all the very best when the tournament gets underway. And here's to victory. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you. Cheers, thanks. huge thank you again to Mary for taking some time out of the England camp to speak with us on the podcast for our specials. You can find a written article from our interview with Mary with our friends at the Offside Rule podcast. It's on their website, which you can find at offsiderulepodcast.com. And don't forget, you can subscribe to their fantastic show on all your podcast platforms. They will be doing daily podcasts throughout the tournament with the likes of Siobhan Chamberlain, Jilly Flaherty and Claire Rafferty as guests. Over here in Sportspiel land, do let us know what you thought of the show. Give us a rating on iTunes, that is always nice. And you can follow us on social media where all of our handles are Sportspiel Pod. We will be bringing you the second of our FIFA World Cup specials tomorrow. That's Monday, June the 3rd where we have former Lioness and one of the key fixtures of the 2015 England World Cup team, Laura Bassett, on the show. Stay tuned, listeners, and you can join us here once again very soon. Bye for now.